Welcome, everyone. I'm Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And today, I'll be giving an overview of web projects. So, a little bit of background about web apps. They were first added to Zojo in 2010, probably the, the latter half of 2010. And with Zojo, you can essentially make desktop style web apps. So your web apps kind of look like desktop apps running in a web browser, which is pretty handy for, for certain type of apps. Now the architecture for Zojo web apps is a little different maybe than uh, some other types of web apps that maybe you've used or created. So there's two parts to it. There's a server side binary. So this is the actual app itself that runs on uh, a server somewhere. And then it has a companion client side JavaScript app that runs in your browser. And this is constantly communicating with the server app. So you kind of have this two part uh, client server model. And this is what allows you to write Zojo code because the Zojo code is running in the server side binary and communicating results back to the JavaScript so that you can see things in the browser. Zojo web apps can be deployed in a variety of ways. Standalone web server is probably one of the more common ways to deploy your Zojo web app. So unlike with uh, some sort of development tools where you've got a bunch of script files that you have to copy up to a server and then have to have the server configured to be able to run that sort of thing, Zojo builds an actual standalone app and that app is run on the server. It's the server-side binary. So that can just be copied over to the server. Uh, the other type of deployment you can do is you can build your web app. It's still gonna be an actual standalone app, but it uses a CGI interface to communicate with an existing web server, Apache in this case. And then your web request will go through Apache and then Apache will pass them via CGI off to the, the web app and start and stop the web app as needed. And then the third option for deployment is for people that just want the fast and easy way to do it and don't want to have to worry about servers or anything like that, and that is our Zojo Cloud service. And of course, Zojo web apps, like the rest of Zojo, can be built in a lots of, for lots of different operating systems, and you can deploy them to lots of different operating, operating systems. So you can run them on Windows, Mac, Linux, and even Raspberry Pi. Although Raspberry Pi only uh, can run the standalone. Uh, I don't really think people have been able to get Apache actually running on a Raspberry Pi. There's not a lot of RAM on those things. So a little bit about the project items that you'll see in web projects. Now, there are the general project items that are in all Zojo project types. And these are class, class interface, folder, image, module. These project items, again, you can use them in desktop projects or you use them in iOS projects. And you can even share them between projects because they're, mm -hmm. they're pretty much independent. So those, of course, are available for web projects. And then web has its own specific project items as well. There's the, uh, the app that's always uh, added to your, your project by default and web has a specific uh, app class in there with its own things on it. Uh, like desktop and iOS, which also both have container controls, web has a container control, but it's different. So you can't share a web container control with a desktop project, for example, but the functionality is similar. Web has something called session, which I'll talk about again in a moment, but uh, that is a unique feature to web. And then web page, is your primary container for UI controls and whatnot. You know, that would be equivalent to a window, say in a desktop project, or a, uh, a view in an iOS project. Web dialog lets you build dialogues that appear on web pages. And that's kind of a different strategy than what you see on desktop uh, apps, which don't have a separate project item for that. And then web styles, is the last thing that's web specific, and that lets you create uh, 
essentially a, a visual style that you can apply to uh, controls that are on your pages. So you can change things like fonts, colors, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, very similar to CSS, but a little easier to set up because you get a, an editor. Uh, now I want to mention a little bit about app versus session. If you've used desktop apps or programmed in desktop apps, you'll see an app class and it's a common place that people use to put things that are kind of global, which makes sense because desktop apps are generally used by one user at a time. So anything that's in the app class, if it's uh, public, will be accessible to the entire app, the entire project. That's the case with desktop apps, also the case with web apps. And a module works very similar to this as well. Although well, sometimes people like to put things in app as like properties or methods. But in the case of web apps, you can have multiple users connecting to them. So sometimes you're gonna to wanna to have information that is specific to each user that is connected. And that's what session is for you essentially get a separate session object for each connected user session. So for example, if I am connected to the web app and uh, I'll pick our, our standard uh, live audience member, Joost, is also connected to a web app. And we both enter our login names and those wanna get saved to a property. Well, we would not wanna save those to the app to a property on app because if I saved mine first, so my name was saved as Paul to an app property, and then Joe saved his name, well, the second person would overwrite the first person because it's global to the whole entire web app. So instead you'd use a session, and you have a name property on a session, and then that is specific. So if I save my name to Paul, it's saved to the Paul session, and Joe would have his saved to the Joe session. So that's how you manage multiple users with a web project, is you wanna take advantage of the session. And this is also a great place to be managing your database connections. Uh, because typically you're going to want to make sure your database connections are separate for each connected user. This allows you to man manage transactions for one thing. Uh, but in the case of other things like SQLite and whatnot, it just gives you a bit better performance. Let's talk a little bit about the build settings that are available in web apps. We already talked about the app that is available in your project and it has several settings on it. You can set what the default web page is that appears when the app first starts. You can set an icon and you might think, well, what good's an icon for a web app? Uh, but it will actually appear while the web app is starting in the browser. So there'll be an icon there. Uh, generally, you're not going to want that to appear for a long time. That would indicate you might need to optimize the startup time of your web app, but it, it is nice to have a little icon. And for uh, mobile apps and things, if you actually save the web app off to the home screen, it'll use that icon as the icon on the home screen on mobile devices. Uh, you can also set some messages for the launch message and the disconnect message that can appear. And you can use those, uh, set those as constants if you want as well to have them localized. And you can also put in some HTML header code if you have something specific for, uh, I don't know, tracking or whatever that you want to have come up in your web app. Shared build settings also has some more settings for your app. There's the version information, you know, version numbers and all that stuff is in there. Uh, there's general build information, which includes if you're building 64-bit or ARM, the optimization level, and whether the web app's gonna support high DPI or high resolution uh, displays. This is also where you specify how you're building the web app. Are you building it as a standalone app or as one that's gonna use the CGI interface? Here's a place for debug settings. And then you get to the specific OS build settings. So these are each of the targets. It'll be Mac and Windows and Linux, of course, and uh, Zotero Cloud will show up there. And those don't have as much settings, but you can set the app name and you can set how you're building it, typically.
I wanted to talk a little bit about deployment because that does come up quite a bit with web apps. So if you're deploying to Linux or Mac, those are pretty similar uh, as far as the overall process. Uh, the thing that's not similar is that, well, frankly, there are not that many people that use Macs as servers. So uh, Linux is by far the most common uh, type of web server. And those can be deployed as standalone, as I've talked about earlier, or as a CGI app that interfaces with Apache. And in the case of Windows, you can also use standalone. And typically people that uh, have a simple web app that are, that are running it as standalone will set it up as a Windows service so that it you know, auto starts, runs in the background. And you can also run standalone web apps if you configure the built-in uh, IIS web server, that's the inter Internet Information Services web server that comes with the, I guess most versions of Windows. You can set that up as a reverse proxy so that it can send uh, requests over to your web app. And we do have a document in the user guide that talks a little bit about that. And we have several users that have configured things in that manner and they've actually put together some guides. So if you're interested in setting that up, you can refer there. And any links that you see in this presentation I'll have in the description uh, for the video when it's posted to YouTube. So standalone deployment. The high level process is pretty easy. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details here. We have those steps in the documentation. And some of the things aren't really Zojo specifics, they're more Linux specifics. So you have to you know, understand the version of Linux you're using. But essentially, you uh, build your app for the correct target based on the version of Linux you're using. So that's either 32-bit or 64-bit. And you really do need to check that. Some, uh, you know, if you're using something like DigitalOcean, uh, they used to have, I think they call them droplets, and they'd have 32-bit and 64-bit options available. And I don't know if they still do, but they did in the past when I last checked. And sometimes a 32-bit version can be more effective if you're running a low RAM setup. It won't use as many resources. So there, there still can be a reason to use 32-bit over 64-bit on a server like that. So do, just make sure you know um, which one you're using so you build your app for the appropriate version of Linux. And then you need to upload the entire app as binary to the server. And then you have to start the app on the server. And again, that varies depending on the server or whatnot. Some of you can create a script. Uh, you can start it manually, probably other options, maybe with a control panel or something, again, depending on the server. And then once the app is running on the server, you can connect to it using the server address and the port that you've started the web app with. So for example, this, uh, actually I left off the ending of the domain, so but you would do something like uh, myserver.com colon and then the port number. So in this case, I'm using 8080, which is the default port for standalone web apps. And if you need more concurrent users than what a standalone deployment can support, you're gonna to wanna to use uh, something called a load balancer or a reverse proxy. Now people always ask, well, how many users can a standalone deployment support? And we always say, well, it depends. And it does depend, it depends on what your app's doing, how much memory it's using, how much processing it's doing. Lots of things. Uh, the upper limit is probably maybe 100 or so. So if you're having that more than that uh, amount of users concurrently connected to the app, that's when you consider a load balancer. There's a couple that uh, people tend to work with, HAProxy and Nginx. And essentially a load balancer is just something that runs in front of standalone app and manages the connections. And if it, you set up the load balancer and if you determine, all right, for you know, every 30 connections, I want to start a new um, instance of the standalone web app. Uh, you can tell the load balancer to do that. And you essentially get multiple versions of the web app running at the same time, which is uh, great. That makes uh, great use of multiple cores, multiple CPUs, uh, that sort of thing. But it does require, obviously, you understanding and configuring these tools. 
DGI deployment is done when you're using Apache, if you want. And you upload the app after you've built it for CGI to your CGI folder in Apache. And then you connect to it using the URL to the CGI. So it would look something like this. And in this case, the web app starts and quits automatically as needed. So if uh, Apache gets a request through the CGI URL and, turn, and the web app's not already running, uh, it will kick off the app and start it and then connect to it and pass the information around. And if it's already running, well, then it's already running. So this can be a simpler setup for people if you already have Apache working somewhere and just want to upload something and quickly get it running. And the last option for deployment is the easiest. This is Zojo Cloud. And when you use Zojo Cloud, you just click on Zojo Cloud, you select your server in the inspector, and then you click the deploy button on the toolbar. And that's it. Now you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to configure anything else. You just uh, click deploy, your app is built, it is uploaded to Zojo Cloud, and then it is uh, open for you in the web browser. So it's very nice very fast, very easy. And uh, people that really don't understand much about servers or Linux or, or don't wanna know that stuff or don't wanna have to deal with keeping the server up to date and applying security patches and all that stuff, uh, Zojo Cloud's a great option. All right, let me switch here to Zojo and we'll just take a look at a web project. kind of look around an empty project and see some of the various parts to it. So you can see when you start a, a web project, the components that are immediately available, you get the app, the session, and a default blank web page. And the session, as I mentioned before, is where you want to put information that's specific to each connected user. And it has everything, you know, like anything else you add. It's got its own events that you can add for processing things. The open event of the session is where you might want to do setup each time a new user connects to the web app. But there's other properties in here, other events in here that you can use as well. So make sure you don't blindly just add stuff to app when you really intend for them to go into session. Uh, the other specific things that can be added to web projects are web dialogues. And when you add one of these, you still get a layout designer where you can add your controls to it or whatnot. Um, you can put a button and a label or whatever. And then you can add those two pages just by dragging them on here and the dialogue appears on the shelf uh, because you have to have to call it in code to display it. And then when you do that, the dialogue can be displayed. It can be displayed as a little slide down from the browser or just kind of a pop-up modal in the middle. I think also there's an option to make it look like a, a floating thing. But it just shows in the page until the user's done interacting with it and then you can close it and then they're back in the page as you want. So a little, a little bit different design. With that, one thing to keep in mind with dialogues and web programming in general is that it, everything is asynchronous. So on, uh, if you're used to programming on desktop apps, there's times where you might do something in a desktop app and your code will essentially stop and wait for an action to happen. That can happen if you do show something modally. Um, could be a modal window or a modal dialog. Your code will stop at that line and wait until the user is done with the dialogue and then the result will be returned and your code will continue. Well, that, that can't work that way in web apps and it doesn't work that way in web apps. In web apps, everything's asynchronous. So if you do initiate a dialogue call, the dialogue's displayed and the code continues running. 
and then the user interacts with the dialog. And when the, um, when the dialog is closed, an event is called. And in this case, you can see the name of the event here. It's the dismissed event. And then in that event is where you can put the code that checks what the user did in the dialogue and then acts accordingly. So that may mean you need to uh, adjust your thinking a little bit and rather than have all your code maybe in one giant method that has a pause in the middle, have your code in two places, uh, the main method that kicks off the dialogue and then the rest of the code in the dismissed event or something that's called by the dismissed event to do the processing once the decision has been made. So just uh, something to keep in mind regarding synchronous and asynchronous stuff that is different between desktop and web. And web styles, give you a style editor here where you can choose various properties to control things. When you add it, you can uh, change the values how you want. Then if you go back to something, you can apply the style to it. In the inspector, there's a option here for style and it'll show any styles you've added to the project. And then when you select it, you can see that the style displays here in the designer. So you can see what it looks like. So kind of neat because, you know, if you do have a general overall theme that you want to use for your entire web app, you can create the style and apply it to all your controls. And then if it turns out that theme needed to change for some reason, you only have to update the style rather than find and update a bunch of controls. Going back to the app, you can see the properties that are here. Uh, the icon property is where you can add your icons in the various sizes. So it's always good to have that filled in and your other information here. Shared properties has the version information, uh, the build settings here and the deployment type here, whether you're doing the CGI technique or the standalone build. And then the specifics for the uh, different operating systems show here. They all, at least, are going to have a uh, name and architecture. And then the Zojo Cloud setting. You can choose a Zojo Cloud server that you've uh, signed up for. And then you would have that selected here. And then you just hit, click this deploy button. And that's it. Your app would be built specifically for Zojo Cloud, uploaded automatically for you, and then launched in your default browser. So super easy. And much like the other project types, make sure you take advantage of the organizational capabilities of the, uh, the navigator. So you can add your folders to organize things as you want and put stuff in folders. Uh, one thing I often do is I tend to make a folder for user interface stuff and kind of put everything in there so you can do organization like that, which allows you to collapse things and make it a little easier to find what you want. You can also right click and open things in tabs so that you can be looking at different things a little more easily. And it's a great way, you know, when you're working on a portion of your app, you're probably going to have, you know, some handful of common things that you're jumping between. So opening them all up into tabs allows you to, to work on all of those a little more easily than perhaps scrolling through the navigator to each one. And you can also add modules. And these are handy. I don't personally tend to use modules a lot for their global aspects, but I do tend to like them for their organizational aspects. So you can actually add things into a module. So here I've added a class that's inside a module, which is kind of cool, much like inside a folder, except that it does give you some uh, naming and scoping differences. And then when you do this, this technically the module kind of becomes a namespace. So if I wanted to access class one here, 
I wouldn't ref and say I wanted to access class one from the a web page. I wouldn't just call it class one because it's inside this DB stuff module. Its name is actually DB stuff dot class one. So that gives you a little bit more organization and structure to your project, uh, which can be handy as projects get large, which they often tend to do. All right, so that's just a overview of some of the parts of a web project here in Zojo that I wanted to highlight. So let's jump back here. Now, if you were around at one of the conferences earlier this year, we talked a bit about something called Web 2.0. This was uh, uh, talked about at the Zojo Developer Conference in Denver back in April of this year, and then again at the Monkey Bread Conference in Munich in September. I'm just gonna to touch on a few high level points here. And first of all, this is in development, still in development, it's been in development for a while, remains in development. But some of the new things that are going to be in Web 2.0 is the web server, in particular, that's the server that's used for standalone deployments, is going to be HTTP 1.1 compliant. There's going to be several significant enhancements by using the jQuery library as part of Web 2.0. And we're going to be using Bootstrap and the Fuel UX libraries as the basis for controls, which is going to give you a lot more controls and theming of controls. In addition, uh, the layouts of your pages are going to have some options available to you. Right now in, in web apps, you can essentially think of the layouts as fixed. Things tend to stay uh, where you put them on the layout. And that's intentional so that they match desktop designs. Uh, but that's not always how you want a web app to work. So uh, two new modes are going to be auto layout and fluid, where uh, essentially the, the controls that you put on a page are going to kind of move around to fit the size of the display. And that is becoming more and more useful, particularly for, uh, you know, tablet and mobile screen sizes that are smaller. And by using Bootstrap and Fluid, there's going to be many new controls and many updates to existing controls. So this is obviously going to be one of the, or be the biggest update to web since it came out in 2010. And we can't wait to get this out for people to take a look at. But remember, it is still in development. So not quite available to look at just yet. But if you are keen on getting the latest information about Web 2.0, including being able to test it when it is ready for people to look at, be sure that you have a current license and are signed up for our beta program so that you'll be one of the first people to see it when it's ready. And another great way to get information about Web 2.0 and all the great new things that Zojo is always working on is to head to the developer conference. And the next developer conference is Zojo Developer Conference next year in 2019. And it is in May, May 1, 2, and 3 in Miami, Florida. You can find out all kinds of information at zojo.com slash xdc. We got a great deal on room rates, only $149 a night. And November, that's this month, is the last month to get discounted tickets. So be sure to head to sojo.com slash xdc and check it out and sign up now if you want to save a few bucks. So a few resources related to today's topic. Uh, remember, you can always go to zojo.com slash download and grab the latest version to try it out and see what's new. And even if you don't even have a current license still, you probably should do this regularly so that you can see what is new. Might give you a reason to update that license. Uh, you can always run uh, your code in a new version without having a license. So it allows you to take your projects, open it up, run it, test it out, see how it works, see if there's some new stuff you want. So do always grab that. And of course, you can have multiple versions of Sojo on your computer at any time. You know, I probably got 50. Uh, so 
you can always just have a new folder with the different versions on there and it's for trying things out. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Zojo YouTube channel, youtube.com slash go Zojo. So you're notified when new videos are posted, including the recordings of these live webinars. If you're new to Zojo, we have a free book, Introduction to Programming with Zojo, which you can find at zojo.com slash learn. And the user community at forum.zojo.com is a great place to search around to any, for any questions you may have. You can just search there, maybe get them answered. You can ask questions. And if you feel like it, you can actually help by answering questions. So it's a fun place to be. And for a few more specifics on Zojo and web, you can head on over to docs.zojo.com. The category, the web category has all of the web related pages kind of in one place that you can jump around between. And the user guide has a few pages as well that you might wanna check out, the overview of web apps and the UI overview of web controls. I can always be reached via email, paul at zojo.com or on Twitter, at Lefevre or at Zojo. All right, Edwin is asking, when using multiple instances of a web app that use the same SQLite database, do I have to see it as a multi-user database? Uh, so I presume that is referring to multiple instances, probably meaning something that is running uh, behind a load balancer. So maybe multiple instances of the web app have been started in that manner. Uh, and if you are going that route, uh, sticking with SQLite is probably not your best bet. Uh, SQLite does not like having different apps connect to the database at the same time. So in that case, you're going to really probably want to go with a real database server, you know, something like Postgres or MySQL. The multi-user setting on SQLite uh, doesn't really enable multi-user. It enables a feature called uh, write-ahead logging that uh, speeds up the writing of data to the database, um, which helps multi-user apps like a web app uh, function better because they don't have to wait as long for data to get written. Uh, but uh, it doesn't help with the uh, multiple apps actually connecting to SQLite. All right, I think that wraps everything up for today. I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great day.